it's going to be on budget, and we're going to put 400,000 more containers. If we make $225 a container, those are the $110 million of revenue a year. If we're earning 10, 10%, that's $10 million of income. That's what we're doing. Okay. Any additional questions in that before he goes to VIG? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've never been accused of being a CPA. I've never been accused of that, so I will make sure our, our CFO and CPA. Well, it, it, it's interesting. Your delegate Manchin had this discussion offline a couple times. He has a different view of he looks at it if you're in an executive boardroom trying to make a decision on a company that you might one day sell it between profit from to maximize what you are earning from those dollars. As we have publicly stated, the port itself, when we did not decide to sell the port several years ago, is an economic engine for our Commonwealth. And so there are little differing in approaches, but hopefully the same outcome and having create, you know, you're creating jobs, income opportunity, and opportunity for our individual communities across the Commonwealth. So we just have a different opinion, he and I, and that, that he, he has those questions, and if he is a businessman, I mean it with all, I don't mean it with anything other than respect, and that's the way his mind thinks. And so he wasn't after you, he was just trying to get answers to questions that are important to him uh, as far as how he makes decisions in his everyday life, I believe. On VIG, this project we commenced on 1117 with the same RMG order. We have 28 uh, arm product. I mean, October 28th, we finalized our uh, cantilever rail mounted gantry crane design and order. We have all of the civil work designed. This project is 100% ready, and we are putting shovels in the ground in February, and we will start building out this project. This project has three major components. There is a rail yard expansion in the yellow, there is the stack yard expansion in the middle, and there is a berth ex expansion right at the far end. 800 feet of berth takes this terminal to uh, 4,000 lineal feet of berth. We'll add four more ship to shore cranes. So this project will deliver, and we will complete this one in 2019, and our target for the NIT is to complete it in 2020. So here's the expansion. It goes to 1.2 million containers. The expanded rail operation will take advantage of double stack so we can reduce the, the track footage and hopefully maybe shorten some trains and still do the same amount of volume. Um, we will also be able to be more cost effective because we'll reduce the cost of each move going to double stack. The four ship to shore cranes and the three berths become critical because that means three of these 12 to 15,000 TU ships could be worked at the same time. We could only do two and a half in today's market. Here's the big budget. It's $321.2 million. This is funded by the owners. This is paid back on the lease that you helped to, to authorize when we went to a capital lease that goes out to 2065 uh, and provides us the purchase right at the end. There we have made an investment. We took the first draw from big of $45.3 million. Right after the first of the year, this slide was created before the end of the year. They have already gone to the market and have their direct funds and their fund costs committed in the global markets for their $321 million. Their bond rating is not as strong as our bond rating, so there was a little bit of a higher rate than the, the state could obtain, but it was built into our lease, and you can see we're working well on our budget. The ROI, part of the ROI of this is the economic impact we can drive for the Commonwealth and the jobs that we will create. And that's why the speculative space and some of the interest that we're growing to Virginia and have companies locate here is so important. We've tried to make sure that we're mindful of getting this spread across the Commonwealth. We have already increased our market share last year. Our market share went from 12.9% to 14.5%. That's because we grew faster than any port on the East Coast or faster than the average on the West Coast. So we're, we're, we're gaining momentum, and this is noticed by all. I want to look at the operating revenue, how we uh, evaluate ourselves. Our operating revenues are growing at an average of 9.6% year on year. You can see that we were $455 million roughly last year. Through the first five months of this year, we're at 1986 so if you annualize where we are, we should come in about 270, or I mean 470, 
as far as revenue this year. And the containers, the 650,000 containers in five months would bring us in at 1.55. So about another four or 5% increase year on year. This is how we do measure the financial performance of the port. It's on operating income, and I want to spend a little time today to make sure because that will change when we go forward and we go to the capital lease, which we now have in place. So I've tried to put a few slides together to help explain that transition. But right here is how we're doing. Through the seven years coming in, we lost $100 million, made 13, 6, and 15, almost 5, and 7, 16. Thus far through five months, we have eight and a half million dollars that we've made, and we will be going for our budget this year was to make two and eight, two point eight, because we're invest back into the facilities. So to explain something that's a little more difficult, and trying to just get a head run, we've always measured the port on operating income. Now that the rent is going to drop down to below the line as a capital lease, and it'll be in with our interest cost. I want to show you what that means right now so that you see the impact. This slide, 31, shows that we made $198 million thus far in five months. It was $8.5 million of operating income. But if we look at the effect of the lease, that would have been another $4.3 million of income, which generates 12.8 operating above the line. It flushes out because the lease cost, that the cost of that 7.2 million comes down below now into non-operating expense. And so we made $4.5 million after all operate, uh, non-operating expenses. And you can see how that would have come across after the 7.8 or at 8 million even. We're trying, we're trying to flush this out because when you wash it all the way down to the net position, the increase of our uh, net position, we were at $523 million before in the old way. We are still $523 after in the new way. It's just that lease cost goes from rent, which is operating cost, to non-operating cost. So we're just trying to show you how the numbers for pure accounting will transfer over. So we'll be making sure we focus on the bottom line. We wanted to show you that to the budget the same way. The operating income budget was 2.2 million. It would now be 22 million because you take all of the rent and pull it down to non-operating costs. So I just wanted to make sure you we were, we were showing you on being transparent in the economics. Our net position, same way, 500 million beginning of the year. And the budget uh, after revising, it does drop a little bit. And the reason it drops is we took on some capital with the lease and there's a little accelerated depreciation. And there's also the cost of our defeasance and the new bonds. <coughs> so there was some other below-the-line impacts of the refinancing. So what is the balance sheet effect? If we look at our total assets, November 6, 2016, without any impact of the lease with big, our net assets were $1.165 billion. On November 2016, after you put in the impact, our net assets are three point. $3.6 billion, and if you come down, that's because you have to look at the liabilities of that lease going out to 2065 on a capital basis. So you come, our total liabilities today are $613.7 million. Our current liabilities, total liabilities and deferred inflows go to $2.8 billion. So the net present value of those forward lease payments because it's a capital program hit us, but it's still a strong balance sheet and path forward. So what are we going to do? We're going to add a million containers. 40% increase. Three years. We're on both sides of the water. The largest risk for us is bringing these projects in on time, on budget, and not about running our headlights because we still have to manage the effective flow of the business today on a reduced footprint that we will have as we start to expand NIT. Big is a different story because a lot of that is in a green postage stamp that is not used today. We'll have to transit across our facility to get there, but we will be in a better place. Uh, economic impact, if this is built out and we build the million containers, that would mean 286,000 new jobs in Virginia based on the historical values that we've created and measured with William & Mary. It would mean 
mean 38 billion more in spending, and it would mean 1.1 billion in state and local taxes. So we have a path forward. Members of the committee, chairman, this I shared with you before. We are there. We're moving. We're in the first five-year plan. We're doing quite well. We're doing NIT and big. We will have a capacity of 2.6 million containers, and we'll be able to remove 40% of our cargo by rail within the next three years. So we'll have this plan going. Then we get into the things we have to do 10 years and beyond. This is to keep us calm going. We have to build the eastward dikes. We have to do the dredging that we talked about before with the GRR. We have to start to get Craney Island ready for the future. And we have to modernize the north end of NIT so we can continue to grow. And then 20 years and beyond, you will be able to decide how fast you want to bring on or when you want to bring on the remaining parts of Craney Island. But it by itself gives the Commonwealth another 3 million container capacity and the ability to be the leading port on the east coast of the United States. And with that, we're in the right place. We've got the right water. We don't have any height restrictions. We've got a plan, and we're growing capacity. We've got the rail and road infrastructure getting better all the time, as, as mentioned by the secretary. And we've got the first in, last out capacity, and we're growing. So we're going to have a good year, and we're on our way. I have a question from John Klingenthal. Very brief, Mr. Chairman. John, that's a great brief. Thank you, sir. Great clarity. I appreciate the hard work you're doing trying to make this happen. Just, just as a, I'm just curious, how much, how much revenue per container? Have you been, actually able to work that down to? A, yes, sir. We, we, we do. We look at our average cost of revenue per container, cost per container, our labor cost per container. We do all of those metrics. So on average in the port, around two hundred and thirty-five dollars is the revenue we get per container. That, that's state revenue, two thirty-five. That's that's the port revenue that we fund. That's 